Good morning. December the 29th. Hard to imagine. But on December the 29th, let's begin with a little survey. How many of you today, on December the 29th, if you were offered a free candy cane, would take it? Show of hands. Okay. For you to have your hands up, there are those available in the back. They are here. I quickly have to tell you a story. I decided that right at the beginning, like right after Thanksgiving, I wanted to do something just to kind of encourage people and people who, waiters and waitresses and all that stuff. So I decided to buy these little candy canes and give them out to everybody I could find. The only problem was, the only place I could find little candy canes like this was Sam's Club. I started with 500 candy canes. I'm way down, I'm way down now, but I've done, any place I've gone, anybody I've served, anybody, I've given to the people in Target as they're working, I, I sent some back to the kitchen in a restaurant I want. But anyway, little candy canes, but if you'd like one, you are welcome, even if you didn't raise your hand, you're just kind of a closet candy cane eater, that's okay too, it's just not a... Secondly, second question of the survey is this, it's December the 29th, how many of you have already taken down your tree and your decorations? All right. All right, that's good. I appreciate your honesty. Now the big question. Question number three in the survey. Today, December the 29th, the first Sunday after Christmas, how many of you this morning are wearing, carrying, bringing something that you got for Christmas you have with you now? Put your hand up. You have something with you for Christmas right now. There are very few of us raising our hand. If you will look around at the rest of the people, these are the people that got coal in their stockings. <laughs> and we're on the naughty list. Christmas, the holiday season, tis the season. We're in a holiday season. And I noticed a couple of years ago that if you look at kind of the holiday season of our country, kind of begin, I know what uh, stores and do as far as advertising, but it kind of begins right at Thanksgiving. And if you think about it, our holiday season is bookend by parades. Macy's Parade, Thanksgiving Day, Rose Bowl Parade, New Year's Day. That kind of encompasses it. I know it kind of trickles out on either side, but that's what it is. And I began to think about seasons. That's kind of a division or a separation, often based upon weather or temperature or angles of the sun. Now, that's not true here in Florida, but for the rest of the country, they go through seasons. But there are a lot of other seasons, aren't there? If you're a sports fan, there's all kinds of seasons. And if you're not a sports fan, you always say, it's another ball season. It's one ball, it's not another. Right now, we're in the midst of football season. It's a season. Unfortunately for many people, this is now flu season. <laughs> or we get mosquito season. And for us in Florida, we are famous for our hurricane season. Seasons. Temporary, a beginning, an end cycle, until the following year, and it comes again. And so it begins with the holidays and with Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year, the song says. It has its own special music. It's a season of giving and getting and getting together. Families and friends and co-workers get together to celebrate, to evoke past memories, traditions from foods to fads. It's a seasonal emphasis and concern for others. Some less fortunate. It's people that give less reluctantly to the bell ringers for Salvation Army. It's the season of peace on earth and goodwill to men. And yet, isn't it interesting, and we've probably all said it this year, since Wednesday, we've asked people, how was your Christmas? As if it was one day or two. And I've heard any number of people who have said, oh, it was fine, but I'm, I'm almost glad it's over. It's almost as if, and we in the church are guilty of it as well, we didn't enjoy, we endured. Now, understandably, for some, this time of the year is tough. It might be the first year of a loss of a loved one. Might not be home or might not have family home or it's a lonely time. And yet that whole concept of 
Well, it's the Christmas season. It's more than season's greetings. It's more than happy holidays. And yet so often is the case, we as believers have pushed back on that, have pushed back from what society has talked about. Well, season's greetings and happy holidays, and we're concerned that a store won't say Merry Christmas. But are we concerned that people know the Christ of Christmas more than if they just say Merry Christmas? Season's greetings. And what we do and what we have done and what we've kind of secured our position is season's greetings. And all of a sudden, the signs, the cards and so forth, even post on social media has said, oh, to oppose the season's greetings, he's the reason for the season. And yet, I think we're a lot like the five-year-old boy who came out of Sunday school right around Christmas time. And he runs up to his mother with this piece of paper and he says to mom, 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 look what I drawed. Look what I drawed. I drawed a picture of Christmas. And if you've ever been in this experience as a parent or a grandparent, you bend down and you go to look at this drawing. And as his mother looks at this drawing, she's more confused than before because what it looks like to her, the drawing is of an airplane and people in an airplane. And so she looks at her son and she said, this is your Christmas picture? And he said, of course it is, Mom. This is my picture of Christmas. And she said, honey, you're going to have to explain it to me. And of course, he gets rather frustrated that she doesn't get it. And so she points to two people in the airplane. She said, this is an airplane. He said, yes. Well, who are these two people? And he said, Mom, that's Joseph and Mary in their flight to Egypt. <laughs> and she goes, okay. Now, the guy in the front, he looks very, very mad. Who is that? Mom, that's Pontius the Pilate. <laughs> and finally, there's this heavy set guy in the back and said, well, who is this? And now he's totally frustrated. He said, Mom, that's Round John Virgin. <laughs> as confused as he is, sometimes, brothers and sisters of Grace Bible, I think we're confused about Christmas. Think of all the Christmases you and I have been through. And with the best intentions, like that little boy, we're confused. Because I want to propose to you this morning that Christmas is more than a season. And thank God it is. And I'd like to do it with the whole concept of Emmanuel. Because that's what Christmas is all about. And if you've got the notes in your uh, bulletin, if you want to follow along and so forth, I want to quickly take us through an Emmanuel scriptural tour. I want to give us the concept of Emmanuel, God with us, that it's a theme that runs all throughout scripture. And so the first one is the prophecy in Isaiah 7, 14, and that a prophecy of the concept of, in the, the context of what goes on is, that God never gives up on his people he never gives up on his plan, regardless of who's in control, regardless of how godly or ungodly they are, God will never give up. And so, when we look at that passage in Isaiah 7, 14, in which we all know, and it said, therefore the Lord himself will give you a son, the virgin will be with a son, and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, that's what God's saying. I'm not giving up on my plan, I'm not giving up on you, and Emmanuel, God is with you. So Emmanuel was a title, a description, more than a proper name of what God would do. Though Jesus literally comes, and he was God, and still is, and still with us. And so with that, you continue on. So you get to Matthew chapter 1, what we just read, the Emmanuel proclamation to Joseph. And Joseph is told in a dream that it's the fulfillment of the prophecy that this son through Mary is now going to be Emmanuel. And can I take a step aside for a minute? And I would love to be a public relations director for Joseph. Joseph's the forgotten guy in Christmas. We forget about him. And yet this guy, merely on a dream, merely on a dream, everything countered, everything he thinks, feels, and society says, acts and follows God. When our youngest daughter, Kelly, was born, she was a couple of months old, and we went as a family to go to one of the live nativity scenes. You've been in those, the churches have done those before, and people dress up, and they have the streets of what it was like in Bethlehem and so forth. And we walked around as a family, and finally the tour kind of somewhat ended, 
in the church sanctuary. And at that point in time, one of the women who was a part of the crowd of the people working at the church broke character and came to us and thanked us for coming. And she said this. She said, our church is probably more predominantly older people. We don't have a lot of young children. We don't have a lot of infants. Would you consider coming back one day and being Joseph and Mary for our presentation? And we said we would. And I remember being dressed up and so forth, and as people walked by, and all the comments were about Mary and about the animals and about Jesus, but nobody really talked about Joseph, and I felt left out. I felt Joseph's the forgotten man of, of Christmas. But this man is exactly who God wanted. It's precisely like Mary. He was the right man for what God had, and on a dream, he acts and, and knows that Emmanuel, God, is with us. Therefore, I'm taking Mary. That's pretty incredible. But there's other things that go through Scripture. I'd give you Genesis 21. It's at that point in time where Abram's making a treaty with Abimelech at Beersheba, and Abimelech says, we are aware that God is with you in everything you do. So long before the prophecy, you've got people who have found favor with God, and those who don't even believe in this God make this comment. God is with you in everything you do. Or you can go to what we just read a moment ago. Deuteronomy 31.6. The Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13.5 says that. This is a time in the transition from Moses to Joshua. And he's trying to confirm the Lord God goes with you. No matter what. Reconfirms it in Joshua 1 5. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. If you know your Old Testament, you know that the temple and the tabernacle were symbols of God's abiding presence. A couple more. One we're very familiar with. Psalm 23 4. I will fear no evil for what? You are with me. There's a theme. You go to Isaiah. <clears throat> 9.6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We hear that all the time at Christmas. What about to the shepherds? Luke 2, a Savior has been born to you, a sign to you. Notice the personal intimacy of the God of all creation who wants to have with his people. And he reaches out and he initiates a relationship. Later on, in the early ministry of Jesus, Mark chapter 3, it talks about that they might be with him. That's why he called the disciples, that they might be with him and the relationship that was built. And two other verses, quickly, that we're very familiar with. How about the end of Matthew and the Great Commission? We're to go and make disciples, and at the end, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then to reconfirm it, Romans chapter 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? And toward the end of that, verse 39, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Brothers and sisters, I would propose to you that the theme of Emmanuel, God with us, is the thread through all Scripture. And Jesus, in the literal sense, was Emmanuel. To reconcile us unto him and develop an intimate relationship unlike any other. Unlike any other. Bible scholar Tim Keller says this. Christmas means that God has gone to infinite lengths to come near to you. Who do you know that will go to infinite lengths to come near to you? Much less one who knows precisely and intimately everything about you. But he wants to be near to us. He wants to come to us. That's the meaning of Christmas and Emmanuel. And so because of that, we have an amazing relationship through the gift of prayer to communicate with him. I don't know about you, but for me, it's very convicting and condemning how nonchalant I get about prayer at times. Yet this God of the universe who wants to be with me wants to hear from me. And we develop this rapport and this relationship. And we develop a greater knowledge of him as we study his word. We get to know him. We be in his presence. We can converse. We learn. We love and we be loved. 
Therefore, Emmanuel, God is with us when we are. And let me just give you a few examples and you can jot them down or have ones of your own. God is with us when we're afraid. Fear is no respecter of persons. Fear gets the four-year-old who's afraid of monsters under their bed to the 84-year-old who's afraid to answer the front door. God is with us when we're overwhelmed and feel like we can't do anything else. God's with us when we're lonely, when we're in crisis. God is with us incredibly when we're disobedient, when we're lost. We don't know left from right. He's with us when we're making decisions. He's with us when we're speechless, whether overjoyed or so stunned we can't bring words to our lips. Emmanuel, God is with us when we're angry, when we're abused, when we've been forgotten. God is with us when we're mocked, when we've lost a loved one, when we failed, when we've lost a job. God is with us when we're guilty, when we're frustrated, when we've been misunderstood. God is with us when we're lazy, when we're busy, when we're bitter, when we're blessed, when we're exhausted, when we're rejected. God's with us when we're jealous, when we're joyful, when we're grateful. God is with us when we're tempted. Here's the one that grabs me. Emmanuel, God is with me when I don't want him to be there. When I want to do it on my own and do my thing, God is still there. And this isn't just anybody, but this is the God of the universe of Emmanuel. And yet, if we truly embrace that concept of Emmanuel, that God is with us, then we also need to understand that Emmanuel, God with us, and us with him can lead to a blemished reputation. There are going to be people you choose to follow Christ they are not going to want to be a part of you. God with us and with him can lead to a pruning of relationships. I remember years and years ago, I was doing youth ministry, and I had a kid who was like a junior in high school, and he came to share with the group what Christ means to his life. And one of the things he said, one of the things that surprised me, he said, about coming to Jesus is, how many friends I lost. That doesn't change in age. Emmanuel, God with us and with him can lead to pruning of relationships. It can lead to vocational suicide. You won't get that promotion possibly because they know your ethics and your integrity. It can lead to being ostracized from certain functions. People won't invite you because they know where you stand. It will lead to harsh and unfair judgment, being misunderstood and misquoted. Emmanuel, God with us and us with him, can lead us to being in the minority, out of touch, and out of step with society. But he's with us. And he is with us so intimately and so personally. That Emmanuel who is with me knows precisely how I feel. How I feel. He's God, so he's promised to be with me. He uniquely created me. And Christmas, incarnation, he became flesh. He, dwell, he dwells among me. He understands. He's sympathetic. So that's why Hebrews 4.15 says that we have a high priest who has been tempted in every way just as we are, but didn't give in. He gets it. He gets you. He gets me. The incredible thing about Emmanuel, God with us, is that he understands and he understands me personally and intimately. He doesn't just blanket that blessing on the people here at Grace Bible, but it's individual, it's intimate, it's personal. And so Emmanuel, God with us, God with me, is an incredible Christmas message.
that goes much further. Tim Keller said this, there's no other religion that says God has suffered. God had to be courageous, that he knows what it's like to be abandoned by friends, to be crushed by injustice, to be tortured and died. Christmas shows he knows what you're going through. When you talk to him, he understands. God understands. Because of Emmanuel, because God is with us, he understands. God's with us because it really happened. He makes a relationship with God a reality. And so therefore, because of that, not only are we known by him, but we get to know him, not simply know about him. Many years ago, earlier in my ministry, I had the blessing and the privilege of doing athletic chapels for the, for the NFL and for Major League Baseball. It's an incredible blessing. It's an incredible privilege to be with athletes and watch them come. And they come for all kinds of reasons. But one of the things that I wanted to share with any athlete that I could, any opportunity in any locker room, any hotel room, wherever it was those chapels were, I wanted them to understand, you get the opportunity to know Jesus personally, not just know about him. And I would relate to those athletes that you'll go out on the field today and there are people who know about you. They've seen your face on TV. They have your trading card. They've seen stuff on social media. <coughs> Excuse me. They'll shout your name, but they don't know you. And they would all shake their head and they were right. He said, you got it. I said, they just know about you. I want to tell you that there's a Jesus, this God of all creation, who you can know personally and intimately, not just know about him. And ladies and gentlemen, there are thousands on top of thousands of people on a day like today, on a Sunday morning after Christmas, who are walking into buildings like this, who know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus, and they've missed Emmanuel. What a tragedy. This is Christmas. Emmanuel. But where's our amazement? How come we're not more stunned? Why aren't we more in awe? I'll give you my theory. It's that. Because he's the reason for the season limits the unlimited love of God. If all you go with is that he's the reason for the season, then you're just basically saying, well, Jesus, like everything else about Christmas, is when the advertisers and the displays and the decorations and music and the Hallmark Channel tell us it is. And we're left with a lot less. And therefore our behavior reflects a seasonal response and lifestyle. It's as if, and for those of you who have already put away your decorations in the tree, it's as if we take him and put him in one of those decoration boxes and we put him on the shelf till next Christmas. He's the reason for the season. There is no season. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and thank God he is. And that he doesn't put us on the shelf until next December. Be careful how we live. Therefore, since Emmanuel is with us all year long, it lets us spend more time all year long getting together with people. You know, those special gatherings, those special Christmas parties, those special things that we do at the end of the year. Why don't we do that more with people all year long if it's Emmanuel and God's with us? If it's truly Emmanuel and God is with us, why don't we extend care and concern for the poor to, and to serve throughout the year? Some years ago, Jeanette and I and our daughter decided we would go to Metropolitan Ministries at Thanksgiving and help give out food. And we called them, we contacted them, and we said, we'd love to come and help give out food on Thanksgiving. They said, okay, if you want to come. But if we got there, there were all kinds of people who were there to give out food. And one of the things they said to us is, everybody wants to come and help at Christmas and Thanksgiving. But isn't the need just as great in April? Aren't people looking and hungry in November or August? See, all of a sudden we've got Emmanuel, we put him on the shelf, and it's only for that time only. Shouldn't it be if Emmanuel as God is with us and we've experienced that, shouldn't we be sharing that all throughout the year? Here's one that will blow people's minds. <clears throat> Why don't we sing Christmas carols in June and May? 
The truth is still there. Now, you get a visitor in, they're going to go, you know, they're going to know what you guys are doing. because. But the truth and the, the message of music, shouldn't we be more open to Emmanuel? To celebrate the abundant life we have all year long, that God is with us. Since Jesus is our Emmanuel, let's live like it. I'm not a big Twitter person. I don't tweet too much. I can't even whistle, so I have a trouble tweeting. But I've started to follow some people on, um, just to kind of follow. And one of my favorite people, who I just think is not only an outstanding Bible teacher, but I think would be a fun person to be with, and maybe you know, is a woman named Beth Moore. And Beth Moore said this. Drain Amazon dry of every book on living your best life. Read them all until you're blue in the face. Highlight them brightest yellow, and not one can compete with eight simple words from the mouth of Christ. It's better to give than to receive. And the only way that you and I have the joy of giving, and not only between November and the end of the year, but all year long, is because we experience Emmanuel, God with us. And so, tis the season all year long to give. And hear me out. I'm not just talking financially. With Emmanuel, it should be all, all year long that we give of our time. And for many of us, it's easier to give from our checkbook than it is from our calendar. Our time is valuable. We need to give of our thoughts, i.e. meaning we're mentally present. You know and I know the times we have been in a conversation with somebody who's there physically, but mentally they are not there. You can see their eyes glass over. As a preacher, you see that all the time. How about the times you and I have done that? And people have said stuff to us and we have not a clue. How about we become more attentive to people? I had a dear friend, anytime you would go to him and you'd say, Rick, he said, Rick, I, I got this prayer request, will you, will you pray for me? Instead of saying, sure, Bruce, I'll pray for you, he'd stop right then and there and we'd pray. I don't care where we were, we would pray. We should be more like that. If God is truly with us, then we need to be more attentive to people. We need to be more willing to give of our emotions. When's the last time we sat and cried with somebody? Of our energy, of our skills. Let me give you just a couple of thoughts as we wrap this up. Let's give, but let's give willingly. We give out of response to him who first gave to us. I've shared with this before. I'm becoming more and more convinced the longer I'm a believer that God is not impressed with what I do. I am, but he's not. God is not impressed with what I do, but he is deeply and intimately concerned about why I do it. Let's give willingly because of Emmanuel. Let's give consciously, focused thought, purposeful, why we're giving, who we're giving to. Really think about it. Let's give graciously, unexpected or undeserved. <clears throat> think about somebody in your family you work with, a neighbor, that you have the opportunity to give, and it could be anything from listening to helping them or so forth, but you go, they don't deserve it. They have burned me in the past. They're a disgrace to our family. You fill in the blank. And that's the perfect example of grace when it's not deserved. If it's truly Emmanuel and truly God with us, we should be giving graciously. Let's give lavishly. And let me give you one example. I become more and more convicted as I hear this statement of when you go to a restaurant, and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, I'm just saying, but for those who particularly come from church, maybe you'll go someplace this morning, maybe before the meal you'll pray together. We were on a cruise one time and we had 10 of us and we decided to pray at the table and as we finished praying, 
one of the people from the cruise line came over. She was with the bar staff. She was not our waitress. She came over almost in tears and said, you're the first group of people I've ever seen pray on this ship together. And began to talk about how it touched her heart and so forth. And I don't have time to go into all the details. But here's my point. If we're the people that leave church and go to eat, if we're the people who, whether we pray or not, let's be good tippers. Because you ask any waitstaff and they'll tell you the cheapest people that come through here are the people who are church people. Man, that reeks of a poor testimony. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm in college. We don't have a whole lot of money. A bunch of us go out. We really splurge. We go to IHOP. <laughs> At the end of the time, all of us be eight or nine of us. If the waitress was cute, one of my friends would be the last one to leave the table, and he'd take all the tip and scrape it right by his plate like he left it all. And we all laughed at him. I mean, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about let's be sincere and appreciative and gracious and lavish, and let's give. And then finally, let's give sacrificially. Maybe it means for you to give of your time, you have to give up doing something that you like to do, whether it's a game you like to watch or a magazine you like to read. Or you give up your time, you give up sacrificially, you give up something that you choose to spend weekly, whether it's Starbucks or whatever it is, but we do that because Emmanuel, God is with us, and we give. Because he first gave to us. Let's lose the seasonal aspect of Christmas. And let's remind ourselves of Emmanuel. God with us. Now and forever. A choice that he made. Joy to the world, our Lord has come. And hallelujah, he's coming again. Amen.